All right, we will go ahead and get started. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Donald McDonald. Uh, Dr. McDonald did his undergrad work in biochemistry uh, at the National University of Ireland and his PhD at Baylor. Uh, after working in industry at Smith Klein and Ligon Pharmaceuticals, uh, he moved to Duke and he is now the chairman of the Department of Pharmacology at Duke University School of Medicine and a professor of molecular cancer biology. Uh, he also serves as co-director of the Women's Cancer Program within the Duke Cancer Institute. And Dr. McDonald has published over 275 articles on the molecular pathobiology of nuclear hormone receptors. Uh, he's received new, uh, numerous investigator awards, most notably the Roy E. Griep and Ernst Oppenheimer Awards from the Endocrine Society and the Robert Ruffalo Lifetime Achievement Award in Pharmacology. Uh, you may have come here expecting to hear about the role of the microenvironment uh, in inflammatory breast cancer, as was advertised uh, around campus. That is not the talk today. That is a talk by Wendy Woodward of a month ago. Um, this talk will be about dyslipidemia in breast cancer pathobiology. Oh. I've revealed your, your joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, thank you very much. Um, it's, it's really a great pleasure to be here again. I, I, I always enjoy coming here because students take my jokes and, and destroy them. <laughs> so um, as uh, Jen pointed out, I, I trained with uh, Bert O'Malley down in Houston. And I, he called me yesterday morning and he said, um, would I um, do something for him today? And I said, Bert, I can't. I'm traveling to Colorado to give a talk. Well, Bert's now 83, and I'm 58, and he still has the mentor-mentee relationship. He still treats me like a graduate student. And he said, now, Donald, if you're going to Colorado, I give you three pointers. One is, I want you to present an interesting story. And I said, well, Bert, all my stories are interesting. And he said, no, Donald. He said, I want you to pick a particularly interesting one. And that's why I think somebody tried to change the title of my talk today. <laughs> The second thing he said is speak slowly. He said, for two reasons. One is you have a really weird Irish accent. It takes people a while to catch up. Um, and he said, um, and also uh, people want to be able to understand what you're saying. And I said, well, Bert, you know, I can't speak any slower than this, so they'll have to listen faster. And, and the third thing he said was tell a joke. Any joke, because as you, everybody knows, Bert O'Malley knows he tells a joke. And in fact, make sure the joke has got nothing to do with your talk, okay, so that they're still scratching your head. And the only joke that I could find, thanks, was this talk, was this joke, which I think is incredibly relevant, <laughs> considering. <laughs> Thank you for giving me a little giggle anyway. I'll tell Bert that the joke went down exceptionally well, that there was... <laughs> There were people falling down in the aisles laughing. But actually, what I do want to talk today is not inflammatory breast cancer, um, but I do want to talk about a project that we kind of stumbled in on, into rather. So anybody who knows the research that's been gone going in my lab will realize that we're an estrogen receptor lab, and for pretty much all of my career, I've worked on beating the living hell out of the estrogen receptor, trying to develop better and better antagonists of the estrogen receptor. But a few years ago, we stumbled onto a project, um, and the best way I can describe it is, is links between obesity, the estrogen receptor, and breast cancer pathobiology. Um, the single, uh, you know, it used to be that smoking was the largest modifiable risk factor for breast cancer. We now know it's obesity. <clears throat> and in fact, you know, this slide, which is, is extracted just directly off the NCI website, is a reflection of several papers that have come out recently that have shown that obesity is definitely a causative, uh, sorry, involved in risk for ovarian cancer, particularly endometrial cancer, where up to 40% of endometrial cancers can be attributable to obesity. 15 to 20 percent of ER positive breast cancers in postmenopausal women. And as nearly all of esophageal uh, cancer is, is, is attributable to obesity, dyslipidemia, and metabolic syndrome. So the problem is, is that we actually don't understand many of the biochemical links that link obesity and cancer pathobiology. But today I'm going to talk specifically about uh, links between uh, obesity and breast cancer pathobiology. Now, <clears throat> when we started this project, which was probably about eight or nine years ago, um, th there really were two and possibly three main hypotheses uh, linking uh, obesity and breast cancer pathobiology. 
The first was is the overfed model, and so that is that over you know that, that triglycerides, which um, are uh, elevated triglycerides, which are uh, just a surrogate for the overfed state, led to production of growth factors from the liver, which of course bound to growth factor receptors um, in breast cancers. The second one, which is probably more relevant or most relevant to ER positive breast cancers, is that for some bizarre reason, aromatase tissue, sorry, bigger part, in adipose tissue, is able to produce aromatase, the rate limiting step in the conversion of androgens into estrogens. And the, obviously, the higher the BMI, the more aromatase and the higher circulating levels um, uh, are seen, especially in postmenopausal women. And third, then, is kind of a more recent model, which is called the Coca-Cola model, um, which is being promoted by Luke Hantley. In fact, he had another paper just the other day in science on this, which is basically related to the fact that not only high tri triglycerides, but high, high fructose corn syrup also causes hyperinsulinemia. And, of course, insulinemia is a growth factor. So that is kind of where the field stood, and, and, and I'm going to hopefully in the next 35 or 40 minutes then is convince you that there are other mechanisms by which um, obesity, dyslipidemia, and the metabolic syndrome impact breast cancer. So how did I get into this? So as I told you, my lab has been working on the estrogen receptor for years, and I will take, I, I'll take credit because I can do it with some humility because I didn't do any of this work. It was done by an amazing group of fellows and postdocs and students in my lab over a few years that led to um, a re, uh, uh, if you want a restructuring or a redevelopment of the models of estrogen receptor action. Had I been standing here 10 years ago, or even maybe, maybe 15 years ago, the model that I would have been presented to you here would have been very simple. Estrogens convert a receptor from an inactive to an active form, and the active form of the receptor does its job. Antiestrogens, like tamoxifen, competitively bind, blocking estrogen to the receptor, and freeze the receptor in an inactive conformation. Well, about 10 years of work um, and a lot of work from my group and others who have looked at crystallographic structures of the estrogen receptor in the presence of different ligand has shown that this is not entirely true. In fact, it's not a true at all. And there's a model then that, we've, that I've depicted on this slide, which we've you know, obviously promoted in many, any venue we can, that suggests that the molecular pharmacology, sorry, that the molecular mechanisms that determine pharmacology of estrogen receptor modulators are much uh, more complex. And really, there are three major rules that describe this. The first is, is that the overall structure of the estrogen receptor, I don't know if I have a pointer here. I don't. The overall, I'll stand up to the side then. This is, oh, I put this on. Uh, we back, we're back in motion, great. So that the overall conformation of the receptor is determined by the, the nature of the ligand to which it's bound. So that's interesting because what it says is, is that by altering, so making subtle changes in the structure of a ligand, you can have a dramatic effect on the overall shape of the receptor. So when we first discovered this, and I, I say this because I just love telling this story, we submitted the paper to science and it got great reviews. And I swear to God, I'll show it to you, it was reviewer number three. And reviewer number three um, didn't particularly like what we had done. So what we had used is combinatorial peptide phase display, which is taking basically billions of peptides to survey the surface of the receptor and then show that there were conformational changes that were induced by ligands and that these conformational changes were not the same. And we were incredibly we were ecstatic with this. We thought this was rocket science. And the reviewer took us down a couple of pegs. probably Jennifer, but took us down a couple of pegs and said... It said, the McDonald Laboratory has, to, has, def, has it developed an incredibly sophisticated, sophisticated technology to detect microallosteric changes in estrogen receptor structure of unlikely importance. So the, I mean, so the science editors came back to us then and said, well, guys, you're going to have to show that these conformational changes are important. And so John, I'm not going to show you all the data. I'm summarizing about 10 papers here. But what John Norris, who's now a professor in my group, did was actually show that what these different conformational changes did was engender different cofactor interactions. And the third part of the story, of course, comes from Bert's lab, which Bert has basically shown that these co-regulators or cofactors um, are different in terms of both their activity and their relative and absolute expression levels in cells. So our three rules then are receptor conf uh, ligands induced different conformations in receptor conformation, which engender different protein, pro which allow different pro presentation of different protein-protein interaction surfaces. That engenders different protein-protein interactions, and the functionality of these protein interactions are not equivalent. 
So from a pharmacology point of view, you can see why we were excited by this, because if you could now identify the factors that were associated with different biological process, say bone biology, cancer biology, cognitive function, for instance, you could now design molecules that will favor one protein-protein interaction over another. And that has led to a, a, a very large cottage industry to develop selective estrogen receptor modulators, pharmaceutical agents whose man relative agonist and agonist activity is influenced by the co-regulated repertoire within cells. So, so about six years ago, I was using the same slide, maybe a little bit different colors, but it's the same slide. And, and uh, I was at the Endocrine Society meeting, and I was presenting the Endocrine Society meeting, and Bert O'Malley came to me and he said, you know, Don, he says, this is a great model. Bert, by the way, keeps coming up in my talk. He calls me all the time. But, um, and he said, you know, this great model, he said, but, you know, your model describes how to explain the differences in synthetic ligand pharmacology. There's got to be endogenous ligands that use the same biology. It's just it's too complicated not to think of that. So David Mangelsdorf and I uh, in Dallas collaborated to actually see if there were endogenous ligands. And he actually... He published the first paper on this, and we, he, we, we divided up the spoils. He went into cardiovascular disease, and I went into breast cancer. And David and I developed a, and validated a molecule called 27-hydroxycholesterol. I'd never heard of it before, and I'm going to show you a little bit of it in a second. And what Dave and, and Carolyn Dussel, who was a graduate student in my lab, had shown is that... Is that sorry? Am I... Oh, I beg your pardon. Sorry. So what David what, and, and Carolyn Dussel in my lab have shown is that this molecule binds very high affinity, relatively high affinity, to the estrogen receptor. And at least in the cardiovascular system, they showed it inhibit the actions of estrogens. Now, before anybody jumps out of your seats and says, wait a second, you said 1.3 micromolar. How can that be high affinity? Well, the intratumoral levels uh, of, of 27-HC are about 10 micromolar. Circulating, circulating levels are around 1 micromolar in normal cholesterolemic patients, people. So um, let me just describe a little bit more uh, about this molecule before I show you some of the attributes of it. So th the first thing is, is that there are two enzymes that you probably will need to uh, remember for some of the slides I'm going to show you. One is the enzyme that converts cholesterol into 27-hydroxycholesterol, and it's an enzyme called CYP27A1. In normal circumstances, this enzyme is highly expressed within macrophages, mainly in the lung. And it turns out that CYP27, uh, sorry, that 27HC is an abundant oxysterol produced in the lung. It's also uh, in, in produced in all macrophages, but just because of the high density of pneumocytes in the lung, there's a lot of the molecule there. The second enzyme I need you to be aware of is CYP7B1. And CYP7B1 actually processes 27-hydroxycholesterol and, and convert, it sends it down the pathway to bile acid synthesis. And this is going to, there's a couple of things that are going to be important here. Remember the enzymes, because we're going to manipulate the enzymes. And the second thing is, is that um, 27-HC should be a good thing, right? Because it is, it's more hydrophil hydrophilic, so, uh, and also it goes to bile acids. So it's a secondary mechanism of cholesterol clearance in the cell. At least that's what people thought. Okay, so Carolyn Dussel, as I told you, Dave's lab and I, we split up. We did breast, they did cardiovascular. And just to remind you that in the cardiovascular system, this molecule is a pure antiestrogen, but not so in the breast. So let's just look at a very at a simple cellular model first. So this is just a very, uh, it's a very simple transcription assay shown on the right and a proliferation assay shown on the left. And which you, I think right, this is a transcription assay as well. I'm sorry, I'm going to show you the proliferation in the next slide. So what you see is, is that estradiol activates transcription, okay? 27-hydroxycholesterol activates transcription as well. I said, albeit completely uh, dramatically right-shifted. But it is a classical partial agonist because you can take the agonist activity of estradiol, the maximum uh, C max, and you can inhibit it down with 27-hydroxycholesterol. It also, in the breast, turns on genes uh, about 50% efficacy as estradiol. So at least it has ac activities like that. And we also did a total gene expression analysis, and it turns out it turns on uh, pretty much all estrogen responsive genes it's to some degree, and, but also has, has activities that are independent of the estrogen receptor as well, and that will become later, important later on. So this is in vitro. Who cares about cells, right? So um, the next thing we want, actually, I'm going to, oh, wait, so the, 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 before I jump to that, I just wanted to point out that, um, and this again will become, so I'm now telling you, remember the enzymes and also remember this. It turns out that the circulating levels of 27-hydroxycholesterol pretty much mirror that of cholesterol. 
okay? Um, and that um, in, in any animal models or human mutations that affect cholesterol biology, anything that affects LDL cholesterol seems to affect in parallel the levels of 27-hydroxy cholesterol. And again, that'll become important. So the hypothesis based upon that simple piece of, uh, of, of um, in vitro data was, maybe what's happening is, is that 27-hydroxy cholesterol produced either um, distally to the tumor um, um, by the options of CYF27A1 uh, elsewhere, or um, through um, um, macrophages that are associated with the tumor, this, uh, this 27-HC can then function as an estrogenic ligand, drive breast cancer for cell proliferation, and maybe in that way it, um, it, imp it provides a biochemical link between hypercholesteremia um, and breast cancer pathology. So what's the litmus test? Um, in, in our field, in the estrogen action, one of the litmus tests is to show that the molecule, if it's estrogenic, can support the growth of estrogen receptor positive tumors when grown in xenografts. Um, it's actually a pretty stringent uh, litmus test because, as you know, a normal circulating mouse, a mouse with normal circulating levels of estradiol, normal cycling mouse, cannot support the growth of ER positive human xenografts because you have to supplement them with estradiol. And so we, I think this is a great litmus test, not just for molecules like this, for endocrine disruptors that people claim to be estrogenic as well. So shown on the, on the left-hand side was the piece of data that committed me to this project and told me that maybe this molecule really has a physiological uh, importance in, in this regard. So here is uh, MCF7 uh, tumors. They're grown in the presence of estradiol. They grow fine. Here are the tumors now grown in the presence of 27-hydroxy cholesterol. Here is the tumors now, if I just withdraw 27-hydroxy cholesterol, they regress or don't grow any further. And if I add 27-HC, um, I can block it with at least partially um, with a pure anti-estrogen. So clearly, this molecule is able to support the growth of an ER-positive tumor. If I come along and I give it a, even in a stronger test, and I take um, MCF7 cells that have been passaged in mice to become resistant to the inhibitory actions of anti-estrogens, in this case, tamoxifen, these, these tumors now um, grow in the presence of tamoxifen, shown in, in, in uh, the orange here, and, are in, and will not grow in the absence of a supplemental tamoxifen. So they grow in the presence of estradiol, but actually 27-HC is as good as tamoxifen or estradiol in promoting the growth of this tumor. So two important tests here. One, it supports the growth of ER-positive tumors, and two, in models of resistance, okay, it clearly has um, the ability to drive the growth of these tumors as well. So we, went, we wanted to go then from these, these uh, um, models to syngeneic models. We've done it in several, and this is just, I'm only going to show you one slide on the tumor growth in the PYMT model. For most of you know the, PY, for most of you know the problem with estrogen receptor positive tumors is there aren't very many um, uh, that you can study in mice. It turns out the PYMT model is estrogen receptor positive till it gets to about um, seven or 800 millimeter cubed. Okay, and then it starts basically losing estrogen receptor, and you start getting um, um, uh, cells that are estrogen receptor negative. But at least in the early stages of the growth, it's estrogen receptor positive, and it's as good as it gets. So what we did was we created um, uh, two mice. I'm only going to show you one. A mouse that was basically deri uh, um, in which we did whole animal knockout of CYF27A1. And when you do that, you can no longer uh, convert cholesterol into 27-hydroxy cholesterol. First of all, the animals are fine. They don't really care. Okay, so that's the good thing. Okay, however, um, those that carry the PYMT oncogene care quite a bit, okay, because it turns out that if you look at tumor latency, I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist looking to see the huge difference in the latency by just knocking out this single enzyme. Okay, about 100 days difference in the latency. And that's manifest also in, in survival, and it's also, and survival is defined here as time to um, 500 millimeter cubed uh, in a tumor. And then this is just looking at a tumor volume. So in all cases, knocking out this enzyme blocks the conversion of cholesterol to 27-HC. And of course, we've developed a, a, an assay to show that we've actually really have knocked out this molecule in the cell, in the animals. It's not there. Um, and secondly, what I will say is that we've now also done it in models of hypercholesteremia, whereby we've knocked in the human ApoE1 uh, um, locus into mice, so that those mice, when you feed them high-fat diet, get hypercholesteremia. They also get large uh, enhanced tumor growth. And if you do that in the background of CYP27, the complete loss of the high-fat diet on tumor growth is lost. So I think it's important. So this is all well and good. So what I've showed you up to now, at least with the tumor biology, is that 
decreasing or modulating the production of 27-hydroxy cholesterol um, seems to decrease tumor growth and, and increase tumor latency. The problem is, is that this is a primary tumor. And the problem with primary tumors, as you probably know, um, is that um, they are curable with the surgeon's knife. Um, and we, unfortunately, we all use tumor growth as surrogates for metastasis. Most of you probably don't know there's only three drugs ever been approved based on surrogates. And so in my mind, it's not a big surprise that we do all of our drug studies looking at primary tumor growth and effects in primary tumor growth, where in fact, the biology that we're trying to inhibit is metastasis. So what about metastasis? So it turns out that if you, if you go and you look at metastasis, again, this is just, uh, you know, the most, I mean, we've got lots of different data on this. This is just the most dramatic slide to show you. If you just look at lung metastasis, which unfortunately, you know, these syngenetic models do not metastasize to bone. Um, but if you, if, you, if you actually look, oh, actually, that's not true. They do, but not as well as the lung. Um, if, if you come and you look at the lung metastasis here, you see that there's a dramatic increase in lung metastasis if we give the animals 27-hydroxy uh, cholesterol. If we now come along and we, we look at, uh, these are mice that are, uh, I, I didn't actually, this is not, not, not I'm sorry, this is, this is animals that we have knocked out, we, I beg your pardon, let me start again. This is animals where we've actually given them 27-hydroxy cholesterol and we get increased lung metastasis. This is not properly marked. This is an animal where we have knocked out the enzyme that gets rid of 27-hydroxy cholesterol, CYP7B1, we get a four-fold increase in circulating 27-HC, and you can see that you increase metastasis. And I'm sorry for not marking this properly, but this is the animal where we knock out the enzyme that produced 27-hydroxy cholesterol, and we lose metastasis. So the bottom line is, is that metastasis is greatly affected um, by the presence of the ability of the cells to make this 27-hydroxy cholesterol. So what about cholesterol? Can I link this back to cholesterol? Here's just one experiment to convince you that this is related back to cholesterol biology and important. So what we did in a collaboration with a former postdoc of mine, Eric Nelson, is that we basically we came along, we took these CYP27A1 positive mice and CYP27A1 negative mice, did a very simple experiment. We gave them control diet or a high cholesterol diet. And you can see that high cholesterol diet really gives you a large increase in lung metastasis if you come along and you do the exact same experiment in CYP27A, one knockout mice, um, you don't get the metastasis. We've now made small molecule inhibitors of CYP27A1, and you get exactly the same effect. So we don't really truly know what is driving the metastasis, except one, there's definitely got to be some sort of a contribution of the immune system. And the reason is, is that I'm not going to show you this data. It was just published in Nature Communications recently. Um, but, but what we've done is, we've, if we knock out either the, the, the granulocytic myeloid-derived suppressor cells and or neutrophils, so you can't really distinguish them with the LY6G antibody, you see that you completely knock out the metastasis. And so one of the ideas here is that, is that 27-hydroxy cholesterol is doing something to the metastatic niche that is changing the Im immune environment that is increasing metastasis. Now, I did mention that this is all the studies in lung metastasis, um, and we really would love to be able to look at bone metastasis, and the reason is, is because I'm going to show you two slides, which are kind of a little sidestep here, because I actually think that this actually may also be important with respect to bone metastasis. And the reason I say that is because most people know that bone resor increased bone resorption um, uh, predisposes cells to metastasize to bone. This is work that was done by Teresa Guys um, many, many years ago. And if you actually use cladronate, or not cladronate, I'm sorry, bisphosphonates, which basically block bone resorption, you can actually decrease significantly the metastasis of breast cancer cells to bone. Well, Carolyn, when she was doing her work in the CYP20, making the CYP27 animals, decided that um, she was actually going to start looking at the bone morphology in these animals. And I'm going to show you just two slides here. This is the bone morphology from wild-type animals. And this is the bone morphology from its, uh, its litter mates, where CYP7B1, this is the enzyme that gets rid of 27-hydroxy cholesterol, is knocked out. There's a four-fold increase in 27-HC. Remember I told you that. Now look at this. There's a dramatic increase, um, a decrease in bone mineral density, trabecular number, and, and, and overall mineral content. And if you just look at that and you ask the question, what about in the context of ovariectomy? Okay, so you're talking about a postmenopausal woman. Just we were doing this for another reason, but I'm just putting it here because I think it's, it it could be important with respect to metastasis. Um, and forget about spine for a second. Look at the mid femur. So this is actually where women get you know um, the most morbid fractures that are in the femur. These are trabecular fractures. 
And what you see is, in the wild type mice, if you over optimize the animals, you really don't get much bone loss. Okay? And that's the same as you would see in a human. Very, very slow bone loss from the mid-femur. But look what happens if I over optimize the mice in the context of increased 27-hydroxy cholesterol. I get a really large increase, um, a decrease in bone mineral density. And so I want to tell you two things here. One is I believe that this is probably contributing or could contribute to bone metastasis in hypercholesterolemic patients that has been known. The problem is I'm not really sure yet how to address that because the, the models of bone metastasis are so bad. And so that's put out there as somebody says, I have a model, I'd appreciate that because we don't have one right now. The second is, is that we've, we actually published this as a separate study, and we ended up getting out of that study, which is fantastic, a collaboration with the Women's Health Initiative investigators, where they went back and looked at, in the, women's health, in the placebo arm of the Women's Health Initiative, which are women who were, who were postmenopausal, who had not seen any estrogen replacement therapy or hormone replacement therapy, we measured 27-hydroxycholesterol in 4,000 patients. And what we found was is that elevated hydroxycholesterol, and this was just published in Bone Mineral Research recently, elevated 27-hydroxycholesterol is, is responsible for between 14 and 16% of all fractures in postmenopausal women. That was, the, the, that was their, their analysis. So it's important in bone, but I actually think it's important in cancer also because, as you know, increased bone resorption is a, is a, is a, a, increases um, the propensity of cancer cells to metastasize to bone. So on, on this, then, I'll, I'll just show you one other thing. We're only starting this, and that is we've just developed antibodies to be able to look at this. It turns out it wasn't as easy we thought, as we thought. never is, right, um, to develop antibodies against this enzyme. And we're starting to do um, IHC. And, and really, the only study, the only data I have to show you that's of any use right now is just one from the Vienna TMA, which is just, uh, is, I think it's about 280 breast cancers. Um, and just to show that we were able to, you know, stain low, no low, medium, and high 27-HC. And it turns out CYP27A1 is, is produced not only by the macrophage, it's also produced by the cancer cells. And that's another story that we don't quite understand. But you can see that the expression of this, um, of this enzyme is quite high in the tumors. And it explains why the intratumoral levels of 27-hydroxycholesterol are so high. And if you basically, if you look at um, low expression and high expression of CYP27A1, high expression is, uh, is gen in generally more associated with those tumors with high-grade cancers. Um, but we have a lot of work to do there. We now have the tools to do it. So I've just told, it's take, taken about 20 minutes to tell you about um, how, uh, how CYP27 and, uh, and the molecule it produces, 27-hydroxycholesterol, um, is negative. And, and there are pathological consequences in cancer. But to be honest with you, none of that made any sense to me. Because anytime you read about 27-hydroxycholesterol, its function is actually, in, the, in normal physiology, is to mitigate the impact of hypercholesteremia in cells. And so none of this made any sense to me at this time. And I'm going to, hopefully, by the, the, the next few minutes, or 10 or 15 minutes, is tell you that how I've gone from it doesn't make sense to now I think it does make sense. So this is the model that comes from lots of pieces of paper, lots of pieces of data, David Russell's lab at UT Southwest, our lab, and also Brown and Goldstein. And, and the, the bottom line is this is the model that people, you know, really up to now has thought has been the model to explain the role of 27-HC. Cholesterol is converted by the enzyme to 27-hydroxycholesterol, which is two phase. It's eliminated, goes to the liver, modified by CYP7B1, and converted into bile acids. The second thing, though, it does is that it serves as, as a, a, um, a, a sensor to tell the cells that it has made enough cholesterol. And what it does, it binds to a molecule called InSig2, which is a molecule that is a chaperone that keeps another enzyme called SCAP, which is a protease, um, uh, associated with InSig2 in an inactive state. And, and that this, this, this molecule, this complex, um, is responsible for processing SREBP1 and SREBP2 to convert them from a preform to an active form, SREBP1 driving cholesterol synthesis and SREBP2 driving fatty acid biosynthesis. And 27-hydroxycholesterol actually interferes with this action of InSig2, blocking this particular transformation. So if this is true, then if I give 27-hydroxycholesterol to a cancer cell, okay, or any cell, it should shut down producing cholesterol. And, and, and so it was kind of 
why would it be that if it's going to shut down cholesterol biology, how could it be pathogenic at the same time? If it was doing its normal job of restoring, of restoring cholesterol homeostasis within the cell. And so when Lou in my lab did a series of experiments, and she just asked the question, well, if you just take cells in culture and you just treat them with 27-hydroxy cholesterol, what happens? Well, I was expecting that there was going to be no effect because I've just shown you that it's pathobiological, that it has these, these tumor promoting activities in vivo. Well, no, it doesn't. If you look at these are, uh, we've done this in, about, in, in, in over 20 cell lines now. This is just uh, cherry picked. I, I, I picked, <clears throat> excuse me, um, 41 cells, met one cells, and uh, we know why. Some cells are resistant to 27HC, some cells are sensitive to 27HC. Um, but when you go through them, you basically divide cells up into those that are sensitive and those that are resistant. But in the most part, when you go back and you look at gene expression, what you find is 27HC is doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. It's shutting down the activity of SREBP1 and 2 in these cells. And so here, look at this. There's um, uh, HMG coa reductase, it shut down. Fatty acid synthase shut down. Um, ACC, acetyl coa carboxylase, ABCA1, LDLR. All of the genes okay, that we know are responsible for increasing cholesterol content within a cell are shut down. Again, this doesn't make sense. Remember, people forget that cholesterol and cholesterol biosynthesis is a checkpoint, is a cell cycle checkpoint. Cells have to increase intracellular cholesterol by fourfold before they can divide. And so this is really, this is, you know, a, really a paradox that we couldn't explain. So we, we tried to explain it by saying that maybe estrogen receptor positive cancers are different. And that if you have an estrogen receptor positive cancer, is that you know, by function as an estrogenic <coughs> ligand, you drive the estrogen receptor and you override the inhibitory actions of modulating SREPP1 and 2. And so that's kind of where we landed. And so that the estrogen receptor, when activated, drove tumor growth. And that's what I was able to show you up to now. But that what I didn't show you was, is that actually um, in estrogen receptor negative tumors, okay, at least initially, 27-hydroxycholesterol seems to um, inhibit their growth, um, definitely in vitro and somewhat in vivo. So how can I reconcile this? Well, when, who's the postdoc, said, I don't know of anyone who was hypercholesteremic for one day. I said, what do you mean? She said, because all the experiments that we have done, basically you come along and you elevate cholesterol for you know, a couple of weeks, Okay, and then you look at the tumor growth and you take them off. She said most people um, and, and all the clinical studies are looking at hypercholesteremia over years. So maybe what happens is the cells are adapting okay, in some way uh, to this, and that 27HC no longer is involved in this homeostatic mechanism, and it bypasses it. Okay, we'll give it a try. Well, the first piece of data, she said, was let's go ahead and look at cells and passage them uh, um, in vitro. This was done in vitro. We also did this in vivo for several, for several weeks and then see what happens. And what you see is, is that this is the various cells along the way here. Look at this one here. This is a dramatic example. Here's a, here are cells that are dramatically, this is a melanoma cell, are dramatically inhibited by 27-hydroxycholesterol. <laughs> but over a period of time, they really don't care anymore. The other one is PYT, PYMT230. They're partially resist sensitive over a period of time. And they don't seem to care. And then look over here at this other melanoma cell. Melanomas are really, really sensitive to the action of the 27HC, but over a period of time, they don't care. And so we said, oh, and that's interesting. So they've become sensitive to 27, they've become resistant to 27 hydroxycholesterol. And now, um, what would happen? So when put these cells into animal models, and all I can say is that she has created monsters. <clears throat> Look at this. These are PYMT tumors. These are the sensitive versions and the resistant versions. These are 41s, the sensitive and the res sorry, yes, the sensitive. Sorry, sensitive and the resistant. Okay, models. This is the this is the Gem6 model of melanoma. Look at this. And here's two different, exactly the same thing, two different sublines um, of the HCC1954 uh, cells, two different sublines and growing well. So by exposing cells to this molecule at concentrations which mimic that in the blood, okay, we have done something to these cells to make these cells beasts. If you come and you just look at proliferation, just in vitro proliferation, first I'm going to show you metastasis, but uh, you can see, look at this. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that we have done something, and all we have done is passage these cells. We've done something by allowing them to be continually exposed to this agent, 
that's created this monster. And then what we did was we looked at metastasis, and this is actually a terrible slide. I'm sorry for not replacing it, but I don't, show, I don't think you, it, it turns out this is actually a lesson for graduate students. The, the luciferized assay doesn't always work for, for looking at metastasis because they methylate the, recif the reporter, <laughs> and they methylate the gene, and they shut it down. So we actually, um, we, we were about to throw this experiment out. This is, this is just looking at, um, I think this is the PY230 cells, the sensitive cells, the resistant cells, but all you look at this. Look at the, the look at the, the morphology. There's virtually no metastatic lesions in any of the lobules with the resistant cells. And look at the look at the sensitive cells. So I've nicknamed this the walnut phenotype in the lab because I think the lungs now look like walnuts. And you want to see with melanoma, you don't even need you could I could stand up that room up there and you'd see the melanoma because they have the melanoma and they're black as soot. And so the it again melanoma cells that have not been exposed to this molecule don't do anything. They do not metastasize. But once they've been selected in the presence of this molecule, they metastasize. And so we went back and we said, well, that's, that's easy. Guess what? What would the first thing you'd predict has happened? You've lost the negative feedback. That that beautiful negative feedback mechanism where 27HC works to shut down all the genes required for cholesterol biosynthesis is shut down. Well, that hypothesis was shut down by an ugly band of facts. Because it turns out that the, the regulatory pathway still is maintained. Look, this is the looking at, this, just look at all you need to look at is the 27 HC here, the sensitive and the resistant. And you say there's no difference right across the way. The negative feedback mechanism of 27 HC is still there. So, what is it? Well, one thing that when noticed was, and this has been noticed in statin treated cells as well, is that there is a dramatic accumulation of lipids within these cells. So I said, we've done this now. I am not exaggerating. I say we've done this over 20 different cells. And it's pretty much the same phenotype throughout. You look at 41 cells. You treat them with 27 hydroxy cholesterol. Sorry, big one. The, the, the sensitive and the resistant version. Sensitive and the resistant are 3 by 230. These are 1954s. You quantitated this by just looking at using by Dippy in this particular case. I'm going to show you we did a full metabolomic analysis in a minute. And what you find is that there's a real large increase in neutral lipids. Turns out it's not cholesterol. Turns out there is a little bit of cholesterol, but it turns out it's pretty much um, just about every neutral lipid you can think of is increased. And so what happens is is that when you come along, and it's not it's not inherent uh, uh, fatty acid biosynthesis because you can see. Look at the, these are the these are the different sublines. Okay, you can see that the, these are the phospholipids, the neutral lipids, sphingolipids, free fatty acids, sterols. In all cases. In, in normal lipid-containing media, there's accumulation of these lipids within the cells. If you do this in delipidated media, there really isn't an increase, except you know, maybe in this particular subline. So it says that it really is a dramatic accumulation of these lipids and not necessarily a switch to produce the lipids, which makes sense because I told you that 27HC is still shutting down SRABPs. So when you run out of ideas, what's the next thing you do? Do gene expression analysis. I mean, it delays actually having to think about an experiment for about a month. Um, and, um, and, and the postdoc and graduate student goes and does it, and you have to worry about them for a while. And so she went and she did gene expression um, in several of the cell lines, a whole genome. Uh, this is not single cell. We have single cell done on this now, but this is just the original stuff. And what she was looking at uh, is, is genes that were differentially expressed between the resistant and the sensitive cells. And what was really not surprising is that pretty much every gene that was changed had got something to do with lipid metabolism. But the most important thing that we caught on was a VL, increase in VLDLR, increase in FABP5, um, increase in FABP3, which is not shown here, and then in human cells, in, increase in, in um, the scavenger receptor CD36. And so we went back and we looked at all the cells. We asked, what's happening here? It turns out that what they're doing is that we have shut down their ability to make lipids, to make cholesterol, and they are just turning on any other mechanism they can to compensate and suck lipids. <coughs> some cells, it's VLDLR. Some cells, it's FABP4. Some cells, it's FABP5. And in the human cells, it's invariably CD36. So now we've got an explanation for how the cells bypass this inhibitory action of 27HC but, but I still haven't told you why these cells have these you know, really weird phenotypes. So it turns out, and again, I'm only going to show you uh, one cell line. We've done this pretty much for all. It turns out that in response to lipids, these cells produce massive increases in inflammatory cytokines. Okay? Most notably, 
okay, is the production of C CCL2 and CCL20. And these, these cytokines, then, are associated with increased macrophage function, increased myeloid-derived suppressor cell function. I'm going to show you that it probably is related to the lipids, because if I come now and I basically do this the same experiment in delipidated media, I dramatically uh, reduce the uh, production of CXCL10, CXCL2, and CXCL20, the inflammatory cytokines. I, I won't show you the data. We now know this is all due to activation of NF-kappa B. Um, and so, uh, um, so what is this, how does this, why does this affect the tumor growth? Well, very simply, we're just starting this, and we're actually, we're nearly finished it, but I'm just going to show you one slide. And what we find is that there's a, quite a very large increase um, in myeloid-derived suppressor cells within the, within the metastatic, this is actually done within the metastatic lesions. And there's a large increase in, in, in uh, GR1 positive within the resistant cells. And so the model that I'm promoting right now is that 27-hydroxy cholesterol is shutting down the normal cholesterol and lipid homeostatic mechanisms of the cell. The cell thinks it's fine, or it's actually thinking it's starved, really. It upregulates LDLR, it upregulates FBBP, it upregulates CD36. This causes a massive increase in lipid uptake into the cell. It is non-discriminate. We've actually looked. It's free fatty, it's free fatty acids. And, and um, as I was pointing out this morning, it's also related to ceramide biology. So it's a, one of the sphingosine metabolites is that which activates NF-kappa B. That leads to the production of inflammatory cytokines. That leads to the, the increased uh, uh, um, propensity to recruit myeloid-derived suppressor cells. And yes, I don't have the data, but we've just done it. We've now depleted the myeloid-derived suppressor cells with an anti-GR1 antibody, and we block metastasis. So finally, what we've done is we've made a biochemical link all the way from 20 cholesterol to this um, molecule that is supposed to be protecting us, but that if it's there constantly, leads to an adaptation within the cancer cell. The cancer cell wants to, ad to, to be hyperlipidemic, if you want, and it has to find a mechanism. And it overshoots. That's why you get the massive accumulation of lipids. And that overshooting activates NF-kappa B and, and, and induces an inflammatory response that leads to myeloid, increased re recruitment of myeloid-derived suppressor cells. So one last slide on this before I tell you what you can do about this. And that is, um, we published a paper a couple of years ago that now we kind of maybe understand that we didn't. And that was, I told you that 27-hydroxycholesterol is bad, but yet in prostate cancer cells, what we found was is that the number five gene that's, da that's downregulated in all, if you look at the list of all downregulated genes as cells progress, the number five in that list was CYP27A1. We could never understand that because I'm just telling you that it's bad. And then I'm saying that, that the cells downregulate it. Well, they are basically doing the same thing. So it turns out when they downregulate, this, this enzyme, I don't have the data on the slide, I just have to show you that they, they downregulate it as you go in increasing Gleason score. Um, there's a decrease, uh, increased methylation is associated with um, decreased expression of this particular gene. You can see that uh, CYP27 uh, mRNA is decreased in benign versus tumor, and then this is the overall survival data, okay? Uh, sorry, it's PSA, PSA free survival. So what we think is happening is that in, in the breast cancer cells, they have CYP27, and they have to overcome it by coming up with this bypass regulatory mechanism. Turns out that, as you probably know, prostate cancer cells already have a propensity for lipid, lipid uptake. Okay? Um, and if you have CYP27 around, and if you give them androgens, they suck up lipids, exactly what we think. But if you actually put back, which, which we did, and we never understood this, you put back in CYP27A1 into the cells, they no longer take up, androgen, take up lipids in response to androgens. And so what I'm going to propose to you is that the prostate cancer has done exactly the same thing, really, as what the breast cancer cells that are exposed to chronic 27-hydroxy cholesterol does. They've basically downregulated this regulatory pathway, allowing them to uptake these lipids. So what I believe, then, is I think I've answered the paradox um, and I think that what happens is, is that, yes, 27IC does, in fact, inhibit SREBP1 and 2, decreases all the uh, uh, lipid metabolism because the cell thinks it's got plenty of cholesterol around and plenty of lipids. But that there's an adaptive event over a period of time where the cells realize that that was an overshoot, okay, and then they overshoot again by uptaking lipids. 
and that that increased fatty acid uptake, and in some cases biosynthesis, leads to production of pro-inflammatory cytokines, myeloid suppressor, immune cells, and increased tumor growth and metastasis. And the most ex important experiment is, is that we can obliterate the impact of cholesterol on metastasis using an antibody directed against the uh, uh, myeloid-derived suppressor cells. And so I think that this then suggests that reducing 27-hydroxy cholesterol might be a really good thing. So how might we think about that? Well, statin use has been associated with um, a reduced uh, time to progression in p people who are diagnosed with pretty much any cancer. So let me, let me just back up one step. If you go and look at the literature from Tim O'Hearn mainly, you'll see that the data on statin use and cancer incidence is equivocal. A lot of that is because, A, it's different statins are used, and B, there's no, uh, there's no accounting for baseline uh, cholesterol levels in patients. So let's, let's, ho let's hope that that is all resolved someday. But what is not in debate is a, is a, a study from the New England Journal of Medicine where they looked at the, the Danish equivalent of the SEER database, and they looked at outcome in patients um, in all cancers as a function of, of statin use. And what they basically find was is that in cancer, Cancer, there's a 15% in overall survival in any patient, in any patient population who have received statins who with any cancer. And so I think there's at least that data suggesting that statin use could be important. So Singer Borquist and I did a study. First of all, we developed a, a blood test for 27-hydroxycholesterol, which took us a long time, a lot of money to develop. And if you ever wants it, they can use it now. Um, and we asked a simple question. First of all, in humans, in breast cancer patients, um, can we detect 27-hydroxycholesterol? And like in the animal models I opened with, does, the, does total cholesterol and 27-hydroxy, excuse me, cholesterol correlate? And you can see when I look at total cholesterol, there's a pretty good R squared value. In, independently of whether I look at total cholesterol or LDL cholesterol, there's no correlations with HDL cholesterol. So this would seem to suggest, then, that if I could lower LDL cholesterol, I might lower 27-hydroxycholesterol in these patients. Well, let's go do the study. We did it, and we just published this. And so what we did was we took patients, and we treated them with atorvastatin for four weeks. These are breast cancer patients, and we actually looked at pre- and post cholesterol, and also pre- and post 27-hydroxycholesterol. Now, this is only a four-week exposure, so it's a relatively short. It was, a, it was a window of opportunity in some respects. We were doing the study for something else. Um, and what you see is, is that we're able to decrease total cholesterol, decrease LDL cholesterol, no effect on a HDL cholesterol, and we're now starting to see decreases in 27-hydroxycholesterol. So at least this is a start, right, in that we're able to do this. We're able to take statins, a drug which pretty much they want to put in the water <laughs> and show that statins will actually reduce cholesterol and in doing so, reduce 27-hydroxycholesterol. Clearly, I'd like to be able to eliminate this entirely, and I'm not going to show you the data here, but we do have inhibitors of the enzyme of CYP27, and I think that that would actually be also useful in patients with metastatic disease if you believe the data I've shown you before. But finally, there was a study that was published. I was not involved in this. Um, a study that was published in Breast Cancer Research and Treatment, a, a pilot study that was done by David Feldman. David Feldman, for anybody who knows, he's in Stanford. He's kind of the vitamin D guru. And David noticed that 25-hydroxycholesterol, um, sorry, a big one. David noticed that um, if you basically give a high dose of, um, of vitamin D okay, to patients, that you actually can inhibit CYP27A1. It's an off-target effect because it turns out that the enzymes involved in vitamin D metabolism are very structurally related to CYP27A1. And so he asked a very simple question, and that was, could you decrease 27-hydroxycholesterol um, as you increase 25-hydroxycholesterol levels within the blood? And the answer is, you could. And so now they're actually going and looking at the possibility of using vitamin D supplementation plus statins as a way to reduce not only cholesterol, which the statins will do, but also to reduce 27-hydroxycholesterol um, in these patients. So I started off with this model here. And the model suggests that there were three potential ways that breast cancer could be linked to obesity. One is through hypertriglyceridemia which, of course, impacts, as I told you, the feeding responses and also leads to production of estrogens by aromatase, by, by um, 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 adipose tissue. 
And none of those, they're all, they're all true, and they all do contribute. But a significant comorbidity of, of, of obesity is, hyper, uh, is dyslipidemia, and in particular, triglyceridemia, okay, and also um, hypercholesteremia. And so I would suggest to you that now we basically have to modify the early models by saying that 27-hydroxycholesterol produced by the action of CYP27 influences breast cancer pathobiology directly by impacting the estrogen receptor, functioning as an estrogenic ligand, and secondly, by, um, by inducing a, a, an intracellular activity, a response that disrupts cholesterol homeostasis within cells, that leads to the production of inflammatory cytokines and causes the cells, the cancer cells themselves, to recruit, recruit myeloid-derived suppressor cells and decrease numbers, which I didn't show, of CD8-positive T cells within the tumors. Um, I just want to finish then by just saying, which is interesting, when we published the, the first of these papers, I got a call from a guy called Michael Baker from UCSD, and he said, and in the last paragraph of your paper, you seem to be very surprised that 27-HC was an estrogenic ligand. And I said, well, it kind of was. I never heard of it before. And he said, well, you clearly haven't read my papers. <laughs> and I said, well, no, I haven't. But, I, but what, what did they say? They said, well, he, I'm, a, I'm an evolutionary biologist. Well, that explained why I hadn't read his papers. <laughs> um, he said, and we have proposed um, a, a, a model that suggested, independent of what you have said, is that 27-hydroxycholesterol is primitive, is the primitive estrogen. It is, it was, it, the estrogen receptor was present before aromatase, as you know, evolutionary. And what they propose is that 27-hydroxycholesterol was the estrogen. And so what it looks like is, I would propose, that at least with respect to the estrogen receptor, okay, that this is a vestigial estrogenic ligand. And it's of really no importance in premenopausal women because it's always going to be outcompeted by 17-beta estradiol but it might be important in postmenopausal women. And then we were talking this morning about brain metastasis. Well, it turns out that the place where 27-hydroxycholesterol is the highest is in the brain. And so um, I put to you then that actually, actually that may also function to activate the estrogen receptor and may contribute also to breast cancer brain metastasis. I've had a wonderful time presenting the data of my colleagues here. And I've just put down the names of the scientists who worked on this project. This project, actually, I didn't actually include the poor graduate student, Carolyn Dussel, who actually started this project in my lab, uh, but she's left my lab several years ago. But most of the follow-up work that was done that I described was done by Eric Nelson, who's now at the University of Illinois, Ching Yi, and Suzanne Wardell, who's a former graduate of your program. I've thoroughly enjoyed my visit so far. Thank you very much for your attention. Dr. Nardine. However, <laughs> yeah. What is twenty five? But yeah, it might be. But twenty five D three is the one that inhibits. CYP27A1. So that's where he got the hypothesis. I don't know that he's looked at any of the precursors okay, at all. Because, you know, because vitamin D3 is very, very rapidly converted into 25D3. <coughs> right? And so that's the, enzyme, that's the molecule that, that he thinks is actually working to... Um, sorry, that's the molecule that inhibits CYP27A1. Yeah, CYP27A1. Yeah. He hasn't looked at the other molecules, though, Steve. Yes? Uh oh. <laughs> so about 15 years ago, we published a paper by Dr. Fitzgerald and Star. Yep. Fitzgerald Regulatory Island. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. When we, when we submitted the first paper, they required us to do that, and we actually looked at was there any increase in, in any steroid in the cell, and we couldn't find anything in the cell. So, um, you know, I, I think that you know, it, it quite possibly that maybe within, inter, within tumors it could. I mean, you could build a plausible hypothesis that it might affect cholesterol biology within prostate tumors, for instance, which have been shown to be able to produce androgens. But with respect to the estradiol, estradiol we saw no difference in estrone or estradiol, and we were made to look at that, yes. Yeah, which was the obvious hypothesis. Yeah. Yes, Carol. So you mentioned that your 27 resistant cells were more tumor-genetic. 
Yes. Yes, they are. And they, they've, they've got a very dramatic increase in the markers you'd expect are associated with an EMT phenotype. You know, um, and so, you know, the problem with that is establishing cause and effect relationships. And, and actually, I did skip over one slide because that's the hypothesis. The hypothesis, we believe, is that in vivo, we're selecting out for a subpopulation of cells that already pre -exist. I don't believe for a New York minute that there's actually all these changes occurring. I believe we're selecting out for a population of cells that already have the characteristics, high VLDL, high CD36, high FABP3. So that's what we think. And those cells clearly do have, excuse me, clearly do have increased um, EMT markers, which would explain the increased metastasis as well. Now, let me just say one thing also, um, which I failed to mention, is that we've shown that we've got these aggressive tumors, and we've shown we've got increased metastasis. We've uncoupled them as well, which is important. We've actually shown by tail vein injection and intratibial, intraileal injection um, that we can actually get increased metastasis as well. So it's not just that we're getting increased metastasis because we've got big bold tumors. They're actually independent events as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's correct. So Sean Morrison, Sean Morrison actually, and that's how we got into this. So Sean Morrison called me about two years ago and said, he said, you know, um, you're talking about CYP27 being very highly expressed within macrophages. He said, we find it to be very, very highly expressed in hematopoietic stem cells as well. In fact, they have a paper in JCI now showing that 27-hydroxycholesterol actually modulates hematopoiesis, um, in, and it's links between differences in clonal hematopoiesis and obesity. So there may be links there, Jennifer. I haven't looked into it myself. But more than that, then we gave them the mice to do it. So that might be right. Oh, I'm sorry, yes? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Correct. Yes. We haven't done, it's a little bit difficult to do in the, in the gem models um, because, you know, the tumors, there's so many tumors in different size. And so it's very difficult to do that. Um, I think, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, 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 it's very, very difficult to uncouple that because, you know, when I, when I say uncouple, I suppose the best thing to say is, is that it's not just merely a reflection of more cells around because we, I can normalize when the injections, I can normalize the amount of cells I give. Okay, and the resistant and the and the, the resistant in the sense that are different. So maybe that's a better way of phrasing it because clearly, I'm getting I'm getting proliferation with that at the metastatic lesions. Yeah. Correct, correct. And, and you can, by the way, the other thing I want to mention, I showed you all the data with the statins and that in uh, breast cancer. Um, you know, we we actually and you saw dribbled in there was melanoma all over the place. The reason is is because do you ever work on a project where you're sorry that you actually picked the disease you've been working on all your life? Uh, you know, because it turns out that the effects in breast cancer are great, okay? But I wish that somebody had told me to work in melanoma first because the effects are much better and much easier. And so our first clinical studies um, are going to be in melanoma. Yeah, so thank you very much for your attention.